This is the Humanist Report with Mike Figueredo. The Humanist Report podcast is funded by viewers like you through Patreon and PayPal. To support the show, visit patreon.com forward slash humanist report or become a member at humanistreport.com. Now, enjoy the show. Welcome to the Humanist Report Podcast. My name is Mike Figueredo, and this is episode 242 of the program. Today is Friday, May 22nd, and before we get started, I want to take some time to thank all of our newest Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members, all of which either signed up for the very first time to support us this week or increased the monthly pledge that they were already giving us, and that includes Armand Pai Omar, Ashley, Dana McBail, Dana Quillman, Donna Brown, Eileen Fox, J-O-A-O-B, Jonathan McGeary, Lee Takashi, Marcia Everett, Sabina Curdy, Siddiqui Cleaning Service, and Sen Bai. So thank you so much to all of these kind individuals. If you'd also like to support the show and join the independent progressive media revolution, you can do so by going to humanistreport.com support patreon.com slash humanist report or as always you can click join underneath any one of our youtube videos and become a member right here on this website right now unless you're listening on itunes then you have to go to youtube but anyways we've got a jam-packed episode for you all this week apparently donald trump is taking hydroxychloroquine um yeah so (laughs) we'll talk about that uh additionally jennifer rubin a conservative writer for the washington post explains why she now feels right at home in the democratic party and let me remind you she has not changed her ideology at all she's still just as conservative as she ever was and we'll have a conversation about how bernie sanders recently let us down by missing a key vote that would have made all the difference in the world also jeff weaver changed the name of his pro biden super PAC after bernie sanders was reportedly furious about the pack marianne williamson endorses primary challengers to members of democratic party leadership while elizabeth warren is is endorsing corporate Democrats over actual progressives. And finally, we close the week by talking to Kara Eastman, who just defeated a corporate Democrat in her primary in Nebraska's 2nd Congressional District and is now taking on Republican Don Bacon. So these stories, along with others, will be discussed on today's show. Let's waste no time because we've got a lot to talk about and get right to it. There are a plethora of reasons as to why the left has not been very successful at gaining power in American politics. But one of the main reasons is because I think that the left, largely speaking, generally speaking, has not been tough enough. They're just not willing to go after leadership. And this isn't just, you know, about people running for president. This is elected members of Congress. And we're starting to kind of see, you know, the uh, winds change a little bit. But still, I mean, you can't expect to really affect change from the inside if you're not going after the biggest barriers to change. And that is members of the Democratic Party's leadership. And so what a lot of people can do if they are in a position of influence or power is endorse some of these primary challengers to incumbent Democrats. Endorse Michaela Wilkes, who's going up against Denny Hoyer. Endorse Shahid Buttar, who's running against Nancy Pelosi. These are really difficult campaigns to run. Like what AOC managed to do in taking out Joe Crowley, that is so difficult to accomplish. The fact that she pulled that off was basically a miracle, right? But she did it and she ran a phenomenal campaign, but we can't just stop there. We have to keep going and oust members of the Democratic Party, oust members of leadership especially, who aren't allowing a progressive agenda to even be contemplated on the floor of the Senate or the House. So, with that being said, um, I am disappointed that more people aren't endorsing Shahid Buttar. Bernie should have endorsed Shahid Buttar, and there's still time, but I don't think that he will. Um, AOC could make a difference by endorsing Shahid Buttar. So there's not a lot of people who are willing to stick their necks on the line to, you know, endorse one of their fellow colleagues. And I get it. I'm not in Congress, so I don't have to deal with that pressure of, you know, condemning a colleague um, because that would make for a really awkward work environment. Nonetheless, if you truly care about priorities, then you can't allow Nancy Pelosi to remain at the top of the Democratic Party. Otherwise, the party is going nowhere. She's driving the party into a ditch and we're all suffering because of it. So we need bold change and that means you take some risks right you endorse her primary challenger 
She may try to marginalize you within Congress. She may try to isolate you. But I mean, that's what you've got to do. Bernie Sanders has no reason to not endorse Shahid Buttar. I mean, sure, the Democratic Party would attack him. But here's the thing. Nancy Pelosi, if you remember, was part of these Stop Bernie meetings with Chuck Schumer, Neera Tandon, and Pete Buttigieg, as reported on by the New York Times. So there's already bad blood there. So why not just add to, you know, the momentum that Shahid already has and endorse him. Right now, a lot of people don't know who Shahid Buttar is. So if a lot of these high profile figures within the Democratic Party or associated with the Democratic Party back him, that could be make or break. But with that being said, there is an individual who is very prominent, who ran for president, who decided to do what I think is really, really unexpected endorse Shahid Buttar. And that person, of course, is Marianne Williamson. She came out with a surprising endorsement of Shahid Buttar on top of other phenomenal endorsements that she's been making lately. And she made a really passionate and I think powerful, realistic case as to why Nancy Pelosi has got to go. Take a look. I want to talk to you about a congressional endorsement that I think is very important. I have long had great admiration for Nancy Pelosi because She's the first woman Speaker of the House, and I believe that her achievements have paved the way in really profound ways for women such as myself. At the same time, I am a lifelong Democrat who has become very, very concerned with the corporatist direction of the party in too many cases. And I admit my own experience uh, in, the camp in the presidential campaign showed me how the control of certain forces at the expense of progressive voices is a direction that is taking Democratic Party away from the principles on which I was all, always raised to believe it stands. And so in this election, I feel that we need to do everything possible to make a strong stand for those of us who have been Democrats, for those of us who are Democrats. We need to take a strong stand for the progressive vision that many of us feel is absolutely essential, not only for the future of our country, but also for this next election. And as a consequence, I am now endorsing Shahid Buttar uh, for the seat, the congressional seat in the San Francisco district where Nancy Pelosi now serves. We have to get right to the heart of things and the Nancy Pelosi's of this world, and I say this with all due respect for Nancy Pelosi, have got to hear us that we are serious, have got to understand that yes, we on the left will challenge you. We on the left that, God, Nancy, this was what we always thought you were. This is, this is what I always thought the Democratic Party was supposed to be. We've heard long enough, how yes, you understand. No, 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 no. This last Heroes Act, that did it for me. Mm -mm. Should be $2,000 a month, until this is done, we need Medicare for all. We need a, a, a show of, of compassion for the American people. That is simply not the agenda these days for the corporate-backed Democratic Party. And if that doesn't change, I think we're going to have a hard time this year. And America is even going to have a harder time in the future. So I hope you'll check out Shahid Batar because I think he's worthy of our support. He's, um, he's a perfect challenger for Nancy. I think this is good for Nancy. <laughs> that was excellent. And I cannot emphasize how important this move is. A name like Marianne Williamson, who ran for president, is endorsing the challenger to the leader of the House of Representatives. This is huge. This is a game changer. And look, Marianne Williamson, she doesn't necessarily have anything to gain from this, but she does have something to lose because if she chooses to run for president again in 2024 and i hope she does you know she's going to go into that race knowing that leadership doesn't like her if you endorse a primary opponent of a member of leadership they're gonna hate you but she did it anyway she did it anyway because she is principled and she's bold she's not trying to curry favor with the left. She did this because she genuinely believes that Nancy Pelosi is an obstacle to progress. Yes, decades ago, she was a pioneer when it came to social justice. You know, she spoke out in favor of LGBTQ rights, but now she's blocking Medicare for all, which would save lives, right? She's not effectively challenging Donald Trump. She's failing us in a number of ways. So she's got to go. She's got to go. She's out of touch and quite frankly, she's a bad person. Nancy Pelosi 
is a bad person. She's a multimillionaire. She doesn't care about what poor people are experiencing. So she's got to go. And if nobody wants to be, you know, um, bold and endorse her primary challenger, then you can't complain about Nancy Pelosi. So for Marianne Williamson to do this, I, I just, I value it so much because if you truly want to beat the Republican Party, well, you've got to acknowledge that they're the final boss. You have to get to the sub boss and beat them first. And that boss is Democratic Party leadership. And if the left doesn't actually take on effectively Democratic Party leadership, Nancy Pelosi, Chuck Schumer, Steny Hoyer, we're never going to be able to win because we're not going to be able to challenge Republicans because people like Nancy Pelosi are going to use their institutional powers to squash the left at every turn. So you've got to fight fire with fire and challenge them. Take their jobs. And things like this help. So I absolutely love Marianne Williamson. Like, she has completely won me over. We don't agree on every single policy. But in terms of her strategy and her priorities, we're absolutely aligned. And everything that she has done has proven to people that she cares about the issues. She cares. You know, she wasn't just running for president as a vanity project. She was running because she genuinely cares about left-wing issues. And, you know, she's not willing to stay silent as leadership fails the people, which is so important. It's one of the biggest things lacking from the progressive movement. Nobody wants to call out leadership. Everyone's too afraid to speak up. But Marianne Williamson has absolutely been vocal at calling out leadership. I mean, look at this tweet that she shared about the HEROES Act. Quote, even if we're only speaking in crass political terms, how can the Democrats think all these incremental efforts are going to inspire anyone? It's like trying to sexually seduce someone with new office equipment. <laughs> <laughs> and there are so many tweets like if you go through marianne williamson's timeline everything she's saying is in lockstep with the progressive movement so look it's really important to have leaders in the progressive movement because you can only be a leaderless movement for so long until you know you start seeing increasing factionalization you see you know the movement itself kind of dissipate this is why you know I worry so much about Bernie's movement because look at what happened to Occupy. Even though that was a leaderless movement with no hierarchies, and I think that's commendable, you've got to have a leader to kind of steer the ship. And we have a lot of progressive leaders, and one of them unquestionably is Marianne Williamson. And she is one of the few leaders we have who's actually willing to call out Democratic Party leadership. And I cannot stress how important that is because, again, if you want to critique Republicans, that's all fine and dandy. They're awful. They're terrible. But they are the final boss. If we cannot use the Democratic Party as a vehicle to actually take on the Republican Party, then it's going to be very difficult to affect change. So that means we've got to oust members of the Democratic Party's leadership who are obstacles to change. And this is the most basic thing that you can do to facilitate that goal. Get people out of leadership who are steering the party in the wrong direction. And Marianne Williamson is helping with that. And I absolutely love her. She's the real deal. And I cannot tell you how valuable she's been as a leader. Um, to me, she is just, I mean, I, I love her. I don't know what else to say. I know I've said that, but it's so nice to see someone who is being principled and actually is committed to a progressive agenda, you know, a new vision for America. And it's great. It's really great to see. It's so valuable, and it really means so much to me. So thank you, Marianne Williamson. I don't know if she'll see this video, but if you do, what you're doing is so amazing. Please keep it up. A couple of weeks ago on the program, we talked about how former aides and advisors to Bernie Sanders have decided to form a pro-Joe Biden super PAC, where they will not only try to persuade members of the left to support Joe Biden, but they'll also be attempting to push Joe Biden to the left. Yeah. How's that working out for you guys so far? Now, I found this absolutely repulsive, obviously, because this is a slap in the face to Bernie Sanders. He founded his campaign on a new fundraising model, right? He transformed the way that politicians raise money. There are dozens of members of Congress who are not taking any super PAC money, who are rejecting donations from large multinational corporations. They're doing it the way that he did it, raising money by individual small grassroots donations. Bernie Sanders changed the game. And so for members of his own team, 
to do this. It's just, it's grotesque. It shows us that they were never really in this because they believed in Bernie Sanders' message. They were in this because they're career-minded. They were only looking out for themselves. They were opportunists. And, you know, this included individuals like Jeff Weaver, Chuck Roca, Mark Longabaugh. And, you know, I was wondering what Bernie Sanders thought about this. He couldn't have been happy, right? And his uh, press spokesperson, Mike Casca, almost immediately denounced the super PAC, saying, we're not associated with this. But we got a little bit of um, inside information about how Bernie Sanders feels because a Vice article by Cameron Joseph explains that Bernie Sanders was not happy. And he actually got them to change the name because he doesn't want people to think that this super PAC is associated with him. Because the name of the super PAC is a future to believe in PAC. So they literally stole Bernie's 2016 campaign message and they're using it for a pro corporate Democrat super PAC where they can raise unlimited sums of dark money for Joe Biden. Like, this is disgusting. So Bernie wasn't happy. And according to this article, he uh, was using some uh, quote unquote colorful language to explain his feelings. So Joseph explains, when a bunch of Bernie staffers formed a super PAC name-checking his old slogan, a future to believe in, he was none too pleased given his well-known hatred of groups that skirt campaign finance limits. So they changed the name. The group will now be known as America's Promise PAC. The change was filed with the Federal Election Commission on Tuesday. We wanted to be as clear as possible that there is no association between the PAC and the Senator, Super PAC head and Sanders advisor, Jeff Weaver told Vice News. Weaver launched the group in late April with a number of other Sanders alumni shortly after Sanders dropped out of the presidential race and endorsed Joe Biden. Their stated goal? To help elect Joe Biden to the presidency while pushing his policies to the left. But Sanders has also spent the better part of his career crusading against the millionaires and billionaires, looking to buy political power, and had a particular ire for Super PACs, which can accept unlimited sums from individuals and corporations. Sanders hammered his opponents for taking help from super PACs during the 2016 and 2020 primaries, and by all accounts, he was rather furious when he found out some of his top advisors had decided to move ahead with one. The senator was informed about the creation of the super PAC before the paperwork was filed, and he was not happy about it, Sanders' political spokesman Mike Casca told Vice News. Numerous other Sanders staff used more colorful language to describe Sanders' reaction to the group. He didn't authorize it, he doesn't like super PACs, and doesn't want it to exist, said one senior former Sanders staffer familiar with Sanders' feelings about the group. Bernie's pissed off, said another. Okay, so I stand corrected. I guess that um, it was his staffers who were using more colorful language. I got excited at the prospect of Bernie possibly cussing, and I guess I was wrong there. I jumped the gun, but according to them, he didn't authorize it, he doesn't like super PACs, and he doesn't want it to exist. Um, and he was furious. Bernie's pissed off. So, I mean, this is obvious, right? The fact that they would do this, I mean, it's so transparent. Now that Bernie's not going to run for president again, they're looking for some other way to advance their careers. And you can't necessarily be successful in the Democratic Party, you know, apparatus in that establishment, in that circle, if you were against the establishment, right? You've got to prove to them that you're loyal. And this is basically what they're doing. This is about optics. Is this actually going to be a successful attempt to lure Sanders supporters into supporting Joe Biden? Of course not. Of course not. Um, and second of all, you're not going to get Joe Biden to go further left by running a super PAC that what advertises campaign television ads how is that going to persuade Joe Biden? Are you going to market ads specifically tailored to Joe Biden? Do you hope he sees the ads? Like, what is the point? Like, this is a fraudulent organization, right? It's all just uh, political theater. They know this isn't going to be successful. They know it's not going to convince anyone to support Joe Biden, especially with the way that they're doing it. This is all about them looking out for their own asses and hopefully getting a job in D.C. in the future after they just ran with an anti-establishment politician who the establishment was very much against. So I'm glad that Bernie Sanders um, got them to change the name. The fact that they used his name from the beginning, I, I think it's just unacceptable. What were they thinking? Like, were they expecting him to think this was a good idea? Why would they use his name? Like, if you're going to sell out because this is what they're doing. They're selling out. If you're going to sell out, then why would you appropriate what Bernie Sanders used as his 2016 slogan when Bernie Sanders, the man himself, is against super PACs? Like, 
How low are you willing to go for a career in D.C.? So, look, I'm glad that Bernie Sanders condemned this and spoke out. Um, I think that publicly he should have made a statement, although since this is technically a super PAC, um, they're not supporting him. But I don't know if legally he's allowed to condemn it publicly. But I will say Bernie Sanders has absolutely got to distance himself from Jeff Weaver because from everything that we know based on, you know, internal um things that have come up, people who volunteered for Bernie Sanders and worked closely with him. I mean, Jeff Weaver was running the show, and even though Faz Shakir was Bernie's campaign manager, everything kind of went through Jeff Weaver in a way. He was really pulling the strings behind the scenes. So, you know, Bernie, he's not going to run for president again, but just morally speaking, I think he is obligated to distance himself from Jeff Weaver. You've seen now firsthand, Bernie, that he's not looking out for you. He doesn't align with you politically. He has a different agenda than you do. And I think the smart thing to do so it doesn't, you know, poison your image politically is um, distance yourself from him. Fire him. Get rid of him. Because here's the thing. Bernie Sanders, I'm assuming, will remain in the Senate for years to come. And you want to make sure that you're able to maintain a pretty large amount of influence and that influence comes from millions of people across the country who trust you who trust your authenticity and who don't believe you are you know um, motivated by anything other than helping the american people and with people who are working for you like jeff weaver i mean there's going to be a question always whether or not Bernie is doing something because he believes in it or whether his misstep is just a genuine misstep or because Jeff Weaver is the one who kind of misled him, right? We already know, according to some people who work with Bernie Sanders, who were surrogates, that Jeff Weaver basically shot down ideas of what Bernie should have done to appeal to black people, for example, investing in black media. That's awful advice. Awful, awful advice. So Jeff Weaver has misled Bernie Sanders before and, you know, in the future, we're going to need Bernie Sanders in this fight. He's not going to run for president again, but we still need him. So to distance yourself from people like Jeff Weaver assures us that you're going to be committed and you're not going to make some of the boneheaded decisions that you made before. Um, also, there's talk that Jeff Weaver is the one who influenced Bernie Sanders to not go negative against Joe Biden, which was possibly one of the biggest reasons why he lost, aside from the media bias. So, you know, going forward, Bernie has got to distance himself from Jeff Weaver. This is someone who's a grifter. And, you know, you've got to understand that from Bernie's perspective, him and Jeff Weaver have worked together for decades. So there's some loyalty there. You know, Bernie Sanders is a very loyal person. But what matters ultimately at the end of the day is where Jeff Weaver's priorities lie. And if his priorities are very much not aligned with yours, then you can't trust that individual's judgment and you've got to distance yourself from him. There are phenomenal people who you can hire as one of your advisors. David Sirota is one of them. Brianna Joy Gray, Nina Turner. I mean, you have so many options. There's no reason why you would stay close with Jeff Weaver, someone who has now just pulled the mask off. He's not in this for the policies. He's in this for, you know, the job opportunity, you know, increasing his power in D.C. So you've got to also take this a step further, Bernie, and distance yourself from him entirely. Because if you don't disassociate with him, then this is undermining everything that you've been fighting for throughout the course of your career. So um, you've got to not have him as your top advisor, you know, uh, sever that tie and move on from him because he is a bad influence on you. I don't have to convince you guys, I love Bernie Sanders. Everyone who watches this channel knows I love Bernie Sanders. I mean, he has single-handedly transformed American politics for the better. He created a movement around progressive policies. I mean, we owe him a debt of gratitude for that forever because of what he managed to do. However, that being said, he is an imperfect person. He's not infallible, and as a human being... He's going to make mistakes from time to time, and lately, he's been making a lot of mistakes. And one in particular, um, it really has bothered me, and I didn't have time to talk about this last week on the program, but it's been weighing on my conscience, and um, over the weekend, this really bugged me. He missed a really key vote that I think was crucial, um, something that pertains to the Fourth Amendment, which has been a great concern to him. He's spoken out against the Patriot Act and, you know, warrantless surveillance on Americans. We needed him and he wasn't there. And the worst part, I think, is that he's been silent. Like, we haven't gotten an explanation as to why 
he wasn't there for us. And, you know, as his supporters, I think it's especially incumbent on us to call him out because he knows this is a good faith criticism. It comes from a place of love, not, you know, an opportunistic attempt to attack him and take him down as we see with the mainstream media. But um, before I go any deeper into uh, telling you how I feel about this, Let's get to the story itself. As Slate's Jim Newell reports, the Senate on Thursday took up a key bill to reauthorize domestic surveillance programs while making changes to the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act with several substantial amendments on the line. One of the amendments introduced by Democratic Senator Ron Wyden and Republican Senator Steve Daines would have required authorities to obtain a warrant to access internet users, search histories, and browsing information. Uh, yes, past that. The amendment, however, met an extremely Senate grave. It failed with 59 yeas to 37 nays, one short of the 60-vote threshold it needed to overcome the streamlined vestigial filibuster. The splits didn't fall neatly along partisan lines. 24 Republicans voted for it, while 10 Democrats voted against it. Would you like to see the names of the Democrats who voted against it? Their names are Tom Carper, Bob Casey, Dianne Feinstein, Maggie Hassan, Doug Jones, Tim Kaine, Joe Manchin, Gene Shaheen, Mark Warner, and Sheldon Whitehouse. Four senators, meanwhile, didn't vote when any one of them could theoretically have saved the amendment by showing up. Senator Lamar Alexander is self-quarantining in Tennessee after a staffer tested positive for COVID-19. We don't know where Nebraska Senator Ben Sass was and do not care. But where was Democratic Senator Patty Murray, ranking member of the HELP Committee and Assistant Democratic Leader, or Senator Bernie Sanders, an independent who caucuses with the Democrats and also constantly comes in second place for the Democrats' presidential nomination? Murray, a spokeswoman, told me after the vote, was flying back to D.C. from Washington State today. She isn't in quarantine. She's just been working remotely. An aide confirmed separately to Politico that Murray would have supported the Wyden Danes amendment had she been there. A Sanders spokesman has not responded to our request for comment about the senator's whereabouts. The Vermonter was last seen on Tuesday participating remotely in a help committee hearing from a room decorated with music-related campaign paraphernalia. He has not cast a vote since the Senate returned to session on May fourth. So the question is, where was he? I don't know. You let us down, Bernie, with this action or inaction more specifically. And at a minimum, you owe us an explanation. People who have supported you, donated hundreds of dollars to your campaign, phone banked for you, canvassed for you, voted for you, caucused for you. You at least owe us an explanation. Maybe he has a good explanation. Or maybe he doesn't. Maybe he's just too focused on these task forces with Joe Biden, which I think is completely a waste of time and energy because that doesn't matter. That's not going to change anything at the end of the day. But his work as a United States senator, which is a very powerful position, actually will make a difference. So the fact that he didn't show up, I just, I don't know what to say. This, this bothered me. It's not like Bernie to do something like this. And no, he's not a sellout. No, he is not, you know, a bad person because of this. From time to time, people are going to let us down because at the end of the day, we're all human beings, including progressive leaders. But he's got to do better. Lately, Bernie just has not been making good choices and he's got to do better. This is unacceptable. And sure, you know, Patty Murray is as equally responsible for this as Bernie Sanders, but I mean... Nobody expected the milquetoast senator from Washington State to come through for us. But Bernie Sanders, it's really disappointing. You know, it's disheartening because if you're not going to be a leader when we need you the most, that's hurtful. That's going to leave a mark. And, you know, it doesn't give me any pleasure to criticize Bernie Sanders. And I feel like I've been dogpiling on him, you know, with everyone else lately. But I don't I don't want to do that. I, w I don't want to give you the impression that, you know... um, He's useless to our movement and we don't need him anymore. No, that's wrong. I think he's he's a crucial ally that we definitely need. But from time to time, as I stated, people who we trust and admire are going to make decisions that disappoint us. They're not always going to be there for us. And the last time I was this disappointed with Bernie Sanders was in 2014 when I saw a video of one of his town halls from Vermont where somebody had asked him about Israel's incursion into Gaza, where they were basically um, indiscriminately killing Palestinian civilians, and he gave a horrible response. He said, you know, Israel has a right to defend themselves. And I found that appalling. And 
uncharacteristic of Bernie Sanders. Now, he's improved on that issue, but it just goes to show you that he's not perfect, right? He's not always going to be right. He's not always going to be there for us. And at times when he's not there for us, at times when he lets us down in such a brazen way as this, uh, as he did here, we have to call him out. We can't give him a pass because he's Bernie Sanders. No, nobody's perfect. And everything that you did is great, but you're still a leader. You're still in a position of power and influence. And if you're not trying to make a difference, then we have to call you out. We have to tell you to refocus what you're doing and actually, you know, pay attention to the things that matters. Like we needed you on this. We needed you and you let us down. And this hurts. It hurts really fucking bad. So if you followed any of Donald Trump's White House press briefings with respect to COVID-19, you know that he talks a lot about a drug known as hydroxychloroquine, which is used uh, traditionally to treat malaria and lupus. And there was never really any evidence to suggest that this is actually an effective treatment of COVID-19, but it's currently being determined through studies whether or not this can be used as a preventative drug to stop people who are at high risk of contracting the virus of uh, stopping them from getting it. We don't, we don't know yet. It's inconclusive. But with that being said, he recently stated that he is currently taking hydroxychloroquine. And um, I'm going to play a clip for you, and then I'll share my thoughts on this. And a lot of good things have come out about the hydroxy. A lot of good things have come out. And you'd be surprised at how many people are taking it, especially the frontline workers, before you catch it. The frontline workers, many, many are taking it. I happen to be taking it. I happen to be taking it. Hydroxychloroquine? I'm taking it. Hydroxychloroquine. Right now, yeah. Yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I started taking it because I think it's good. I've heard a lot of good stories. And if it's not good, I'll tell you right, I'm not going to get hurt by it. It's been around for 40 years for malaria, for lupus, for other things. I take it. Frontline workers take it. A lot of doctors take it. Excuse me. A lot of doctors take it. I take it. Now, I hope to not be able to take it soon because, you know, I hope they come up with some answer. Alrighty then. I don't know what to say about that. Part of me doesn't really believe him because he lies every five seconds. But at the same time, does Trump seem like the type of person to be a guinea pig when it comes to a drug if he truly believes in it and, you know, he's drunk in the Kool-Aid for whatever reason, uh, putting aside any monetary connection that he may have with the uh, drug manufacturers? Sure. So it's totally believable that he would do something like this. But at the same time, I don't necessarily know. Maybe he's just trying to promote this drug more and say, look, I'm taking it and I'm doing fine. So other people should take it as well. It's so difficult to tell if he's telling the truth. And it's just, it's weird. Would I be doing something like this? Um, absolutely not. I don't want to be a guinea pig for any drug. And, um, you know, for him to do this, it just... It, I find this hard to believe because you think that the people around him would say, no, Mr. President, you, you shouldn't take this drug. We don't necessarily know if there are any risks associated with this. But nonetheless, he claims he's taking it. Um, all right. So if you're going to be a guinea pig, might I suggest you try to maybe uh, take your own advice and inject disinfectants, <laughs> bleach? I don't care. Like if Trump wants to take this and risk his own ass, I'm fine with it. Go ahead. Got no love for you. You've murdered a lot of people in the Middle East and North Africa using drones. So I don't care if you harm yourself. Like, fine, whatever. You're a terrible human being. Have at it. But for those of you wondering, okay, the president's doing it. Maybe I should try doing this as well. We don't have conclusive evidence that this actually will prevent you from contracted, contracting COVID-19. Now, the thing about this drug is that it comes with a lot of side effects. I believe my sister was on this, a generic version of it, for lupus at a time, and she stopped because of the side effects. They were they were extreme. Um, so there, there's no conclusive reason to believe at this point in time that it will stop you from contracting uh, COVID-19. 
And here's what the experts are saying. As NPR's Joe Palka reports, medical experts have urged caution around the drug, and last month, the FDA strongly warned against using hydroxychloroquine without medical supervision, such as in a hospital or as part of a clinical trial. Although researchers have been skeptical of hydroxychloroquine's role in treating COVID-19, there is more enthusiasm about its potential to prevent infection. That's because multiple studies have shown that the drug can prevent coronavirus replication. Two such studies are currently underway. One is being conducted by scientists and physicians at the University of Minnesota and will involve 1,500 volunteers at high risk for contracting COVID-19, either because they are healthcare workers or live with someone who has the disease. The study is actively recruiting high-risk healthcare workers and first responders from around the United States. That study began clinical trials on April 6th to determine whether hydroxychloroquine is effective at preventing infection from SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes the disease COVID-19. The other is a multi-center study led by Duke University that is also aimed primarily at healthcare workers. It aims to enroll 15,000 volunteers. Neither study has released any results. Dr. David R. Bulware, a medical professor, professor who launched the University of Minnesota study said there is no data that using hydroxychloroquine as a pre-exposure prophylaxis is effective. It may be. It may not be. We do not know, he told NPR. The only way I would recommend taking hydroxychloroquine is within a clinical trial, he said. So if you're going to take hydroxychloroquine as part of a clinical trial, that matters, right? That makes a difference because they're constantly monitoring you. And if they have, if you have any side effects that you're experiencing, they can treat you. They can look after you. So this is part of the reason why I don't necessarily know if I believe Donald Trump. I mean, certainly he can have a lot of medical ex experts around him, but are they really going to be monitoring him? Does he have time as president to, you know, um, constantly check in and they can see if he's having side effects and if so, manage them? I mean, he does spend hours a day watching Fox News, so maybe I just... I don't necessarily know. I don't care if Donald Trump is taking hydroxychloroquine, but what I don't want to happen is people to, you know, rely on something that they believe would be a cure if there's not sufficient evidence. Like there is, believe it or not, a large contingent of people online who believe in really kooky things that are harmful to their own health. Like there is a uh, contingent, which opens says like cold like on YouTube, of people who believe that drinking trace amounts of bleach is going to help he heal you of numerous medical conditions. And this is so harmful. This is damaging. You don't want people to get the wrong information or ideas about what will actually improve their health if it could be damaging. So this is why the only negative effect of Trump saying this is that it may encourage people to kind of take their lives into their own hands with regard to medications and try to do some type of weird, you know, I don't know, bogus experiment on themselves or take something that isn't necessarily healthy for them. But with that being said, I do not care at all if Trump is taking hydroxychloroquine. Have at it. If you want to take this shit, take it. It doesn't matter to me if Trump takes it and experiences side effects. Who cares? I don't care about Donald Trump. What I care about is the impact that him promoting this drug or, you know, something that may not necessarily be a good treatment will have, you know, because if you're the president, everyone is watching what you do. Um, so, I, I shouldn't have to explain, like, why we have to be adults when it comes to this, why we shouldn't believe, you know, conspiracy theories about healthcare, why we should do everything in our power to make sure that people, they only do something or take a particular drug having complete information. Um, so that's the only, like, negative thing that could come about this. But with that being said, like, again, we're all adults here, right? We have to be adults. So if Trump wants to take it, have at it, but just don't think that because he's doing this, you know, you should try something stupid. I, I don't know. But, you know, if he wants to do it, fine. I don't care. You know, Democrats think that as they follow Republicans to the right, they're just, you know, picking up new right-wing voters and absorbing, you know, that, that demographic while also holding their base. But that's not the way that it works. As they shift to the right... They pick up new ground, but also lose a lot of ground with the left. You know, it's not like one side of um, that spectrum between left and right shifts. Like, it's a block that shifts entirely. And as you shift to the right, you lose the left. And increasingly, as the Republican Party shifts further and further to the right, 
and become a far-right extremist party, you know, akin to UKIP or other really fringe right-wing parties in Europe that we see, the Democratic Party is trying to pick up those moderates that Republicans are losing. And it's why you're seeing politicians in Congress that are basically Republican and Democrat, but indistinguishable from one another, ideologically speaking. Like, Joe Manchin and Susan Collins are very much aligned. You can almost not see any, uh, I think, noticeable ideological differences. They're in lockstep on everything when it comes to economic issues to uh, most social justice issues. So, you know, the problem is that the Democratic Party should never be hospitable to right-wing moderates. But with Donald Trump's takeover of the Republican Party increasingly, we've heard from the so-called never-Trump crowd of more moderate Republicans who aren't necessarily um, in lockstep with the uh, overt nationalism and xenophobia that we see coming from the Republican Party. So they've kind of found a new home in the Democratic Party. So we see people like Anna Navarro go on CNN and represent this never Trump part of the Republican Party. And we see Jennifer Rubin, uh, who is one of the worst people in the country, I think, increasingly admit, you know, I'm no longer really vested, uh, invested in the Republican Party. I kind of found a home in the Democratic Party. And she penned an article in the Washington Post explaining how she actually does feel at home with the Democratic Party. Now, this tells you a lot about the Democratic Party. They should never, ever be so right-wing that a moderate Republican can feel right at home in the Democratic Party. That tells you they've shifted so far to the right that they're not going to be able to hold the base. You can no longer just expect that left-wing people are going to vote for you if you can appeal to people like Jennifer Rubin. And I want to get to her article here uh, because, believe it or not, she does lend us a lot of insight as to why the Democratic Party appeals to someone like her who's just a flat-out right-winger. So her op-ed is titled, Never Trump Becomes Never Republican, and she kind of explains why she now aligns more with the Democratic Party as opposed to the Republican Party. She writes, There once was a friendly debate among those who used the Never Trump moniker about whether the GOP could be saved or was worth saving. Early in the Trump presidency, if not before, I answered no. Many who once spoke of reforming or reviving the party now have come around to the view it is hopeless. I cannot speak for others, but the reason the Republican Party is not worth saving is that with few exceptions, e.g. Maryland Governor Larry Hogan, Massachusetts Governor Charlie Baker, its members have fully embraced Trump and Trumpism, a noxious brew of nationalism, contempt for truth, xenophobia, and an America-first agenda. Any of these would have sent me fleeing from the party. Collectively, they make it impossible to return. Sadly, my feelings toward the spineless Republicans who blindly supported Trump, opposed impeachment, enabled his lies and attacks on institutions, and have not found the nerve, even in a pandemic, to take issue with his lies, impulsive reactions, and dangerous preferences can be summed up in a single word, contempt. Democrats, to the relief of many never-Trumpers, made it easy for us in this presidential election. Former Vice President Joe Biden is a decent, qualified man who is respectful of objective reality, all right, understands separation of powers, and embraces America as a nation founded on a creed. All men are created equal, not on blood and soil. He is no socialist. We can happily embrace him. I would have been prepared to crawl over broken glass to vote for anyone but Trump, yes, even Senator Bernie Sanders, because of my conviction that Trump is a menace to democracy and now a danger to our very lives. It it would not have been a pleasant choice, and many Never Trumpers would not have joined me. Thankfully, we were spared the Sanders versus Trump matchup. Finally, many people ask, are you all Big D Democrats now? My answer is, it depends. I am a Pat Moynihan Democrat, a Scoop Jackson Democrat, an Andrew Cuomo Democrat. I am not a Bernie Sanders Democrat. So where does that leave me? Where I have been for just about four years, a center-right member of the resistance, an advocate for good governance and internationalism, including free trade and robust legal immigration, and a passionate believer in the American creed. The best answer, perhaps, to the partisan affiliation question is that it is a time for creative policy and civility, so we will focus on that. One final point, never Trumpers, now never Republicans, should keep their eye on the extraordinary class of female freshman house centrists, Representatives Abigail Spanberger, Mikey Sherrill, Elaine Luria, and others. A lot of those ex-Republicans might decide they are Abigail Spanberger Democrats. So a lot of people instinctively might see this article and think, wow, this is really smart of Democrats. You know, Trump is abandoning the base, and Democrats are just appealing to all of those people left behind by Donald Trump. Except, let's keep things in perspective. 
the never Trump portion of the Republican Party is a very, very small fraction. And they're boosted and, you know, given this impression that this is a larger phenomenon that it is because we always hear from them in mainstream media. I mean, how often have we heard from Anna Navarro lately? How much articles from the Washington Post from Jennifer Rubin have we seen lately? So, you know, there's this illusion that the never Trump phenomenon is widespread and Donald Trump is just out of step with the Republican Party base. But that's factually incorrect. If you look at approval ratings from within the Republican Party, Trump is comfortably above 90 percent. And, you know, sometimes he dips into the 80s. But for the most part, the aggregate Republican Party absolutely loves Donald Trump. And so here's the main point. The fact that any former Republican can just feel right at home with Democrats while not making any ideological shifts whatsoever, while not changing their philosophy on politics, that is a huge, huge problem. Because it tells you there's a gigantic portion of the electorate that Democrats are abandoning for this small fraction of Republicans. Think about this. We all who watch this channel or, you know, are in tune with progressive politics feel disenfranchised and disenchanted with the Democratic Party. But have you ever thought, you know what, since I don't really agree with Democrats, I'm going to become a Republican? Well, of course not. That doesn't make sense, right? Because ideologically, the Republican Party is at the opposite end of the spectrum that we're all on. But with uh, Jennifer Rubin, she didn't have to change anything about her neoliberal worldview, her free market worldview. And Democrats, you know, she feels right at home with them. That tells you that the Democratic Party has shifted. They shifted to the right. Now, you'll hear people on Fox News like Tucker Carlson screaming about crazy socialists on the far left. And sure, we have more left-wing representatives in Congress now, like AOC and Pramila Jayapal. But... They're just one block, a very small block, who doesn't have that much power within the Democratic Party. The fact still remains, even if we've made some attempts to yank the Overton window back to the left, that Democrats disproportionately are a right-wing party. They used to be centrist to center-right, and now I think you can accurately characterize them as a right-wing party. Because think about this. If you look through, you know, right-wing parties throughout Europe, just take the Tories, for example, in the UK, they are arguably to the left of Democrats on some issues. And this is the conservative party in the UK, because think about this. Boris Johnson, even if you don't necessarily believe him, he believes in a national health system. Now, he's probably just paying lip service to that. He's trying to undermine it at every step of the way and, you know, privatize more portions of it. But he at least has to hide his agenda. Whereas Democrats were openly hostile towards the no notion of Medicare for All, which doesn't even go as far as the UK's national health system. We're talking about, you know, uh, government-run insurance, not health care. And yet Democrats are using the same exact talking points that Republicans use. How are you going to pay for it? 180 million Americans will be kicked off their private plans that they love so much. And it's not just the UK. Look at the Conservative Party in Canada. Again, same thing. They are to the uh, left of Democrats. So this article right here, even if we all can't stand Jennifer Rubin and she's an insufferable hack, the fact that she feels right at home in the Democratic Party shows you how far they've fallen. Because rather than firmly planting their feet in the ground and saying, no, we're not going to follow Republicans to the right, we realize that there are real issues and policy prescriptions that are progressive that will, you know, meet the needs of Americans. So we're not going to follow you to the right and opt for more neoliberalism and private, you know, solutions to public problems. No, we're not going to do that. But they're not doing that. They're not doing that. And as they shift further and further to the right, Democrats are even abandoning the one thing that made them appealing in the first place social justice and racial justice issues and that's awful because once you take away that you know cultural issues you know the left-wing social justice issues then what point is there to vote for democrats you just have two 
economically conservative parties. I mean, think about this. With the Tara Reid Me Too situation, they've abandoned the issue of Me Too entirely. Throughout the course of the primary, we saw scandals with regard to Amy Klobuchar and Pete Buttigieg and their relationship with the black community. And this wasn't really discussed. So I need you to understand, it should never ever be the case that a Republican can feel right at home in the Democratic Party by not changing their ideology. If for whatever reason, Jennifer Rubin thought, you know what, everything that I believed before, you know, following Ayn Rand and Milton Friedman, whoever she, you know, uh, aligns with philosophically, if she has like a political awakening, then that's fine, you know, join the Democratic Party. But the fact that she changed nothing and she still supports the same policies, that tells you that Republicans, or that Democrats rather, they met her. She didn't change to meet the Democrats. The Democrats changed to meet people like her. And it's not like Trump is the only catalyst of this phenomenon. You know, Democrats have been inching further and further to the right as, you know, Republicans have inched to the right as we go deeper into late stage capitalism. But that should never happen. It tells you we have no left wing choice. Neither of the two parties represent the most popular policy positions. I mean, think about this. A majority of Americans support Medicare for all. And this is not in the manifesto of either of the two parties. A majority of Americans want to legalize cannabis. This is not in the manifesto or party platforms of either of the two mainstream parties. So there's a huge portion of people in this country who are just not being represented. Their ideas, which I think are the right ideas, progressive ideas, more democratic socialist ideas about worker co-ops and whatnot, these are not being represented. Whatever happened to, you know, demand, there's a demand for it, so why isn't there anyone filling that demand? Sure, you have politicians here and there individually filling that demand, but if the Democratic Party was serious about winning, they would try to adopt more left-wing policies, and they wouldn't shift further and further to the right to appeal to disillusioned Republicans. But the fact, again that they are easily able to appeal to people who are former Republicans when that Republican, like Jennifer Rubin, has not changed ideologically. That is such a huge issue. And it tells you that we've got a lot of work to do. After she ended her 2020 bid for the presidency, Elizabeth Warren has been doing a lot of things, making a lot of moves to grow her influence within the Democratic Party. And one of the things she's doing is endorsing Democrats running for Congress. Now, what this has really shown us, if you weren't already aware of who she actually is, is that she's not serious about getting progressive policies implemented. Because the individuals who she's choosing to endorse are um, not progressive. And there are very viable progressive candidates who are running who she just completely ignored. And some of them who aren't necessarily the most ideal, most progressive, who I don't support. It doesn't make sense why she, in her position, isn't supporting someone who is very obviously a quote-unquote war and Democrat, whatever that means. So let's talk through a couple of these uh, endorsements here. Because they are really showing who Elizabeth Warren is in actuality. The first person who we'll talk about is Teresa Greenfield. And Elizabeth Warren chose to endorse her over the true progressive in this race, Kimberly Graham. She tweeted, I'm proud to endorse Teresa Greenfield in her run to represent Iowa in the United States Senate. Her life has been defined by hard work, determination, and resolve. I know she'll put the needs of Iowa's working families first. Okay, well, we know now how important healthcare is, Medicare for all. So what does uh, Greenfield have to say about the issue of healthcare? Well, she claims healthcare is a right, but yet she doesn't actually believe it is a right in actuality because she only supports quote-unquote access and explicitly does not support Medicare for all. Rather, she says she just wants to expand the Affordable Care Act to include a public option. Now, looking at Kimberly Graham, however, she explicitly supports single-payer, which includes dental, hearing, and vision coverage all free at the point of service. Now, ask yourself this. If Elizabeth Warren was serious about Medicare for all, would she be endorsing 
the anti-Medicare for All candidate over the pro-Medicare for All candidate? Of course not. So when progressives told you that Elizabeth Warren backed away from Medicare for All in favor of a public option, this is more evidence that what we were saying was correct. Because if you want something, don't you think you would endorse people running for Congress who would actually help fulfill your vision? Don't you think you would hold strong no matter how much criticism you face? So she endorsed someone who is just a standard run-of-the-mill Democrat who doesn't support Medicare for All, who's championing access to affordable health care, which is entirely subjective. We all have access to a lot of things in life. I could technically purchase a Lamborghini. I have access to it. Does that mean that I have the means to? Of course not. So this is meaningless. This is corporate Democrat speak. But Elizabeth Warren endorsed this person over someone who's very bold, Kimberly Graham. Unbelievable. But that's not all because she chose to endorse Jerry Nadler over another real progressive named Lindsey Boylan, saying, I proudly endorse Chairman Jerry Nadler in his run for re-election to Congress. His record shows that he doesn't just know how to fight, he knows how to win. I'm honored to call Jerry a friend and someone I continue to work with on important legislation. So first of all, Jerry Nadler does not know how to win anything. He's a standard, run-of-the-mill corporate Democrat, and if you truly wanted to affect change, why would you endorse him while someone else is running who actually has a real vision for America. And look, I get that you don't want to endorse someone who you consider, uh, you know, the primary opponent of your friend. That's fine. But you can just sit this one out. If there's a real progressive option running, why not just sit this one out? Why do you have to make an endorsement in this instance? Well, you don't have to, but she chose to do it anyway. And what's weird is that this uniquely contradicts what she claimed to stand for during her presidential campaign, because as Jordan Sheridan points out, Elizabeth Warren boldly called for Google and Facebook to be broken up as a candidate. Google is Nadler's top 2020 donor. Facebook is number five. So why would you endorse someone who stands against what you said you believed in? Why? What's the point of that? It makes no sense. So as she builds this brand of Warren Democrat, she's got to explain to us what that means in a policy sense, because we get what it means politically, right? But what does it mean when it comes to policy? What does the average Warren Democrat stand for? Because it seems like we don't know. This is, you know, inconsistent. And the ideology of, you know, the average Warren Democrat seems pretty incoherent or non-existent altogether. Now, the thing about Jerry Nadler is that you can make the case that, you know, maybe he's not as bad as people like to make him out to be. He co-sponsored Pramila Jayapal's Medicare for All Act, and that's great. I give him credit for that. But the problem is he's taken thousands of dollars from health industry packs. So how are we supposed to trust him when there is an actual progressive option who's not taking that money, who also claims she supports single-payer Medicare for All? And the thing about this is Lindsey Boylan actually feels betrayed by Elizabeth Warren endorsing Jerry Nadler over her because she used to respect Elizabeth Warren and she responded to Warren's endorsement on Twitter saying, I have been a big supporter of your career and it's unfortunate that you looked right past me to the guy who it took three decades to pass three things and who takes as much money from companies as he does from people. How is that progressive? She adds, this is my daughter writing you a thank you note for running for president. I told her all about you. I won't tell her the story of how you didn't even bother to know who I was was before you endorsed my opponent. And she concludes by saying, by the time I'm at your stage in life, I promise I will not overlook other women and close the door behind me. Yeah. And I feel for Lindsay because, you know, if you truly believe someone is progressive, for them to not endorse you for someone who's milk toast, who doesn't actually get anything done, who doesn't stand for anything, it seems to fly in, you know, the face of what you stand for. But again, Elizabeth Warren doesn't stand for much. You know, whatever progressive ideals she came into Congress with, I mean, she's clearly abandoned them. If she truly was a progressive, don't you think she would have endorsed Bernie Sanders when it would have made a difference after Super Tuesday when she dropped out? No, she chose to remain silent because now she hopes that maybe she can be Joe Biden's VP. So it's just, this shows you once again that Elizabeth Warren doesn't stand for much anymore, and she isn't actually committed to progressive policy proposals. But let's put, you know, these two endorsements aside. One endorsement that honestly doesn't make sense to me, uh, or lack thereof, I should say, is Ayanna Presley. 
Let me remind you, Ayanna Presley, she broke from the squad when they all endorsed B Bernie Sanders and she endorsed Elizabeth Warren. Now, we kind of expected this to happen because they're both from the same state. But Ayanna Presley stuck her neck out and became a surrogate, one of Elizabeth Warren's top surrogates. Gave her that progressive credibility as, you know, a member of the squad. And Elizabeth Warren has yet to endorse her. Now, you can say that endorsement is coming. Maybe she'll endorse her in a week or so because she's been kind of like trickling out these endorsements. But how is Ayanna Presley, who has been loyal to you, not your number one endorsement? I have nothing against Ayanna Presley. She's not my favorite progressive. And, you know, I'm very skeptical of her. But if I'm Elizabeth Warren and this person who I needed to get an endorsement from was there for me, why not endorse her? I don't think Ayanna Presley is even going up against a primary challenger who can beat her, who's strong, if there are other options. In fact, I don't even know. So you literally lose nothing. So why aren't you there for Ayanna Presley after she was there for you? It makes no sense. So Elizabeth Warren, once again, is proving she just she's a coward. She doesn't really stand for much. And she's showing you she's not committed to progressive policies because if she was actually, in fact, committed... Don't you think she would be making endorsements of candidates who explicitly support what she said she supported when she ran for president? So, look, the reason why I'm talking about this is because in 2024, assuming Joe Biden is unable to beat Donald Trump, there's going to be a vacuum left open by Bernie Sanders' absence. He's not going to run again. And Elizabeth Warren is going to try to fill that void being left open by Bernie Sanders, but acknowledge she's not real. She's going to Obama you because she doesn't believe in anything. She's proven that time and again. She's gone full mask off. I don't think you needed this extra information to demonstrate how much of a phony she is, but in case you still weren't convinced, here it is. Now, I brought Kimberly Graham, who's running for the Senate from the state of Iowa on my show, and she's a phenomenal candidate, and I'll link you to that interview down below, but I have not yet had the pleasure of talking to Lindsey Boylan, so I'm going to show you one of her campaign ads, because after watching this ad, you can't say that Elizabeth Warren had a legitimate reason to just ignore her, because this is a serious candidate with the real record of actually accomplishing meaningful things. Take a look. Before the pandemic, I was focused on issues that are more relevant than ever, and I had my story ready to share with you. How I got to New York. How I was able to build a career and a family. How I love it here, but ours is the most unequal district in the country. How I fought for higher wages and better housing in our city. And my credentials. I was Deputy Secretary for Economic Development for the state of New York. And then the world changed. New Yorkers are living and dying through this public health crisis. It's outrageous that congressional leadership went on recess without getting enough cash in the pockets of those who need it the most. I come from three generations of women who've lost custody of their kids because of mental illness and addiction. My family would have been devastated to miss just one paycheck, so you can be damn sure that as a congresswoman, I won't be taking the week off while millions of people file for unemployment. Growing up, I had my share of struggles, but I've always said, what can I learn from this and what can I do about it? So I led job creation for the state of New York. After the federal government abandoned public housing, I negotiated hundreds of millions for NYCHA. After Hurricane Maria, I led disaster relief efforts in Puerto Rico on behalf of New York. I've dedicated my career to public service. We need to elect people who have skin in the game. It's not just that I understand how our issues are connected, it's that I'm gonna do something about it. So, I mean, Lindsay is qualified. She's accomplished. She has a real agenda. You can actually go to her website and see a plethora of policy positions that are bold that she's taken. Whereas with Jerry Nadler, I mean, he's been in Congress for how long? We don't really know what he stands for. He'll do um, whatever he thinks is going to be politically expedient. So that's who, you know, Elizabeth Warren chose to endorse over Lindsay, over Kimberly. And that's just really, uh, it's, I don't even want to say it's disappointing because there's this implication that I'm shocked by this. I'm not shocked by this at all. This is exactly what we've come to expect from Elizabeth Warren. But meanwhile, I mean, Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez is endorsing progressive candidates like Nabila Islam from Georgia, like Sam Lee Lopez from New York, and Marianne Williamson, 
also a presidential candidate in 2020, just endorsed Shahid Buttar, Nancy Pelosi's challenger. Michaela Wilkes, Steny Hoyer's challenger. She also just endorsed Eva Putsova. So, I mean, everyone else is trying to do everything in their power currently to affect change, to get more progressives elected to Congress, whereas Elizabeth Warren is endorsing a bunch of inc incumbent Democrats over progressives, which um, makes no sense. She's endorsing um, corporate Democrats over progressive Democrats. I, like, if you thought that Elizabeth Warren was progressive, that's fine. But now that she's gone full mask off, don't be surprised when she does even more things that contradict what she purportedly stand stood for, you know, in the past. She's not progressive. Or at least if she is progressive, um, ideologically speaking, she certainly isn't committed to getting that vision carried out, right? So, I mean, this is Elizabeth Warren now. Um, I'm at least thankful that she is not hiding the fact that she doesn't actually care about progressivism. Uh, that's... That's good, at least. You know, being honest is, is good. But um, just, again, don't be surprised because this is who Elizabeth Warren is. Hello, everyone. I am here with 2020 congressional candidate from Nebraska's 2nd Congressional District, Kara Eastman, fresh off of her primary victory. She's here to talk about what she did to be successful and how we can help her win and defeat Republican incumbent Don Bacon in November. Kara, thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you for having me. I'm, I'm so honored to be here. You know, I, I was telling Kara before we came on that her success here really helped to kind of pull me out of this funk that I was feeling, um, you know, because it, it seems like everything that we worked for in a way was crashing and burning before our very eyes. And, you know, there's still a number of really fantastic members, uh, congressional candidates running for Congress across the country. And your victory meant so much because it showed us that, you know, we can still win. We still have a lot to fight for. And this election isn't over. Like we may have not been successful at the top of the ticket, but we can still really have a tremendous impact, you know, when it comes to congressional races across the country. Um, So I just want to ask you, because this is really a difficult question that we're all asking to ourselves selves how did you win like what do you think you you did what were the key ingredients to your campaign success because you're running in nebraska and you know conventional wisdom would tell us that you have to be kind of centrist and you you can't be too bold but you've run on this really bold unapologetically progressive campaign your advocacy for single payer is just phenomenal the way that you explain it i think is perfect um so what do you think made you successful well i mean Part of it is just hard work. We we were able to, you know, in 2018, we knocked on about 200,000 doors. This cycle, we made a full pass of the district before the coronavirus hit. I think my field director today said we had about 320,000 attempts at voter contact, either at the doors or by phone. And so I think hard work is part of it. But, but the other piece is, you know, I, I'm fortunate enough to have run in 2018. So I do, my name ID is relatively high in the district. I think that helps. But also I think people are looking for authenticity in a candidate. And even though we don't always agree on everything, at least people know who I am and what I stand for and where I stand on things. And, and I think now it's just a matter of candidates trying to get people to understand that while not everybody agrees on progressive issues, there, there's, there's so much common ground. And I think part of the problem is, is like messaging, it's, it's buzzwords that throw people off. We learned this, right, from Obamacare, Affordable Care Act, people didn't know they were different things, or they thought they were different things. And, and so I think that's how it's happening now. Like you walk into a room and say Medicare for all, and half the room shuts down because they're like, oh, I don't like that thing that that guy was talking about on TV for <laughs> years. Um, and so, but the reality is when you explain it to them, when you say this is cheaper for the federal government, this is a lot cheaper for you. This means you actually have choice and freedom when it comes to health care, that you, you don't have to go with in network, out of network for no apparent reason whatsoever, that you're not going to get hit with surprise billing. I think then people start going, huh, that's really interesting. Then you get a pandemic and you and people say, wow, untethering health care from employment. Not so crazy. Yeah. And when I saw um, or when I when I posted the video of your single payer, um, uh, basically, you, ma you make the case for single payer and you kind of respond to all of these talking points that we've seen that have largely, you know, um, manifested from within the industry that are fed to politicians. Um, you broke down all of these anti-Medicare for all talking points, I think, brilliantly. And one thing that I, I noted when I talked about that was that you really you have 
a great way of explaining something to where you meet people where they are. So understanding, you know, the context of the district that, you know, that you're running in and all of that unique dynamics there, you know, you, you, you touch on these aspects of freedom, which is important to people. You know, you will be more free under a Medicare for all system. And what's interesting is that the minute you won, your opponent, Don Bacon, Republican, uh, immediately started lambasting you on Twitter with this absurd Twitter thread going through all of the ways that you are kind of this cuckoo crazy person and he's really trying to frame you as someone who is an unrealistic candidate and what is going to be your response because he already is trying to really focus on single payer and he's trying to use that to bring you down how are you going to basically um repel some of these attacks and what do you think will be the best strategy going forward to actually beat him because I think this is a very winnable race and it's going to be difficult. But if you win, this could really change discourse nationally when it comes to where progressives can and can't win. So how are you going to beat this guy? Good question. Um, well, well, first of all, we're lucky, right? This playbook has been played for decades about Democrats, about ideas, Medicare, that this was the same narrative, Social Security, same narrative that this is crazy pie in the sky idea. Um, and so, so there's that, right? There's the, the fact that this is, this is a traditional playbook that they bring out to try to make someone look nuts when really what we're saying is like, there's a better system out there that actually saves money. And, and, and obviously when, when there's a woman running the, the narrative, they love, you know, they love this narrative. Like I'm, I'm this radical socialist, crazy person. Um, that I don't have the right temperament, all these kinds of things. Well, like I, I've run nonprofit organizations for over 20 years. My temperament's pretty calm, pretty cool. And I've gotten things done that people said couldn't get done. And that's by building coalitions, by bringing people together. So I think one, we have, we have an obligation to point out where his, his playbook is the Republican playbook. It's the Trump playbook. And, and he's just regurgitating speaking points given to him by a party. I've never been that person, nor will I ever be because I, I am gonna fight for the things I believe in and any party can tell me what they think I should say, but you know, I'm just gonna be me. And, and the other part of this is the reality is Congressman Bacon has voted three times to take away healthcare from people without a viable plan to replace it. When he talks about his plan, which was had some made up name, th there's no way that that's gonna save money. And, and I can't believe that, a, that somebody, you know, where the Republican party has traditionally been this party of fiscal responsibility, they're now completely rejecting, although not completely, right? Because when we look at single payer, it keeps growing among, you know, in popularity among Republicans. But they, they're, they're, uh, some of them are rejecting this idea that we could have a system that's much more efficient, that eliminates waste, and that saves money for people. I don't quite understand why that would be unpopular. Oh, wait, yes, I do. When the pharmaceutical companies and the insurance companies are coming in and lobbying and paying for politicians to say this crap, it works. And so now it's time for us to stand up against those things and say, we're going to elect politicians who don't take corporate PAC money, who aren't bought and sold by industry and by special interests, and who are actually going to fight for regular working. And frankly, right now, people who aren't working yeah. in this country, because this is what we need and what we deserve. Yeah. And the irony is that he accused you in his Twitter thread of wanting to, quote unquote, take away people's health care. But that's what he voted to do three times, because if you just want to repeal what we have in place, Ob Obamacare, it wasn't perfect, but it it's better than nothing. But if you repeal that and you don't have a replacement plan, that's quite literally taking away health care. So there's this weird conflict with their talking points. On one hand, proponents of single payer want to take away health care, but at the same time, it's too expensive and we can't afford it. Well, which one is it? If we're taking it away, then... There's nothing there to pay for, right? So, you know, and these talking points don't make sense because they're meant to really confuse people. And at a time when we have whistleblowers like Wendell Powder, who came from the industry, who says, hey, I helped write this choice talking point that politicians are now using. I think there's really nowhere to hide. And I wanted to ask you, because you've talked to so many people, what is the reception when you talk to people who don't necessarily know about Medicare for all and might not necessarily be dispositioned to support a progressive? What is the response when you explain it to them? Because I think the way that you explain it, it's basically you can't explain it in a better way. You break it down in such a phenomenal way. That's why I shared that video rather than your actual campaign ad when I talked about your victory, because it's such a great way. Because part of what I think has been missing with progressives is we're great at talking about policy, but marketing is, is difficult. Marketing in the sense that we don't explain policies 
as well as we should. And I think that you really are, are honing this craft. So what is the general response from people who might not necessarily be inclined to support something like single payer off the bat? Well, I feel lucky that I've had been able to have these conversations so many times because trust me, there are there are definitely people in the district who, who don't or agree, agree or didn't agree. And the reality is if I can get three sentences out, inevitably they say, oh, I hadn't thought of it that way that way or oh i didn't realize that so inevitable i mean I, I i remember this distinctly we had a fundraiser when we could actually go out in public right yeah. um at a, at a small bar called the tiny bar and uh and the the former mayor of omaha was there he's a democrat he you know he would consider himself a, a pretty moderate democrat and he's a supporter of mine but he's he asked me a question there and he said i don't know about this medicare for all thing explain it so i did three four sentences and afterwards, he came up to me and said, you sold me. You sold wow. me on it. Same thing happened when we, we wrote a two-page paper, kind of a Q&A on, on single-payer health care. And we had a, a Republican state senator read it and say, wow, I'd never seen it broken down like this. I, I don't know how I couldn't support something like this now. So I, I think, look, there's been so much misinformation, unfortunately, by both Democrats and Republicans put out there. There's, there's a lot of misinformation being spread on purpose. Some of it just because people are running and they want people to be more amenable to their ideas. And they think if they're more moderate, then it won't scare people as much. And I, and I understand the fear. It sounds crazy that tomorrow morning, some of us could wake up without healthcare. Well, except for the 30 million Americans who just lost their healthcare, right? Um, but like for, for most people who have a job, who have healthcare, and, and it sounds insane. Well, one, there's a transition program. This isn't an overnight approach. This, uh, this isn't snap our fingers and get health care. But, but it's, it's rational, it's reasonable, and it makes sense, and it saves money. So I don't see why we wouldn't at least put out this idea this, you know, and, and see where we go. Like There's going to be compromise along the way. I, I actually, one of the things I'm concerned about is overutilization. And I talked to Pramila Jayapal, a congressman who introduced the bill, and we talked a little bit about this. And she said, there's places in the bill that prevent that. But I get why people would be worried about that. You know, people worry that people are hypochondriacs and, and are going to use healthcare too much. And then what do we do if we have to wait in lines? I get all that. It's scary. But the reality is we would we're, in the United States of America, we would come up with the system that works and we can do it in a way where we're actually saving money, eliminating waste and giving people freedom to choose their health care provider. I kind of want to go back to um, your victory. Part of the reason why I felt um, really frustrated with, you know, the 2020 election is because, you know, COVID-19, it really changed the dynamic of a lot of these congressional races, because I think that, you know, the bread and butter of grassroots candidates is to knock on doors. So you managed to win during a pandemic. Can you explain how COVID-19 changed your race and how you adapted and how that's going to change, you know, the race going forward? Because, you know, as far as we know, this could continue until November. We don't necessarily know how long social distancing and self-quarantine will be, uh, you know, something that is a necessity. So how did you adapt? And going forward, what would you say to other progressives who are currently running campaigns who haven't, you know, um, they haven't won yet and their primaries are coming up? How do you think they can arm themselves to adapt to a pandemic? It's tough. And as I said before, I think the fact that we did have relatively high name ID helped, obviously. Um, but we we were able, I have a great team, and they were able to very quickly reconfigure so that rather than knocking on doors, because we stopped you know, immediately once we felt like it was unsafe for either our team or our volunteers or people at the doors. Um, when we stopped door knocking, we immediately switched to phone banking. And, and there were days where we were making, you know, we had one weekend where we made 30,000 phone calls to people in the district. And wow. there's the technology out there to do that. And if you have a strong volunteer base, you can make that many calls. But it's really a, a relying on that grassroots support. And I think that's the nice thing for most progressives. They have that support already. So they can just really mobilize their own people and come up with some creative solutions. We did a program called Kids for Cara where we delivered little coloring sheets in bags with crayons and stickers to kids. We had about a hundred people request these bags around the district on TV and mail. But I think you also have to look at other ways of reaching people and certainly the phone, especially when the pandemic hit was the best way because people were home and answering their phones. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, 
I wanted to ask you about the current fight that's being waged in Congress. Uh, we saw Pramila Jayapal really speak out because Nancy Pelosi didn't include her provision to uh, guarantee paychecks to workers that you fought for. And after a large portion of the agenda of the Con Congressional Progressive Caucus wasn't included in the HEROES Act, and most progressives voted for it anyway, I wanted to ask what your position would have been. You know, as a member of Congress, would you have still voted for the HEROES Act? Or would you have, you know, taken the Jayapal stance and not voted for it? Because, you know, I, I get the conflict internally. You know, there's some good in that bill, but at the same time, a lot of the progressive agenda was left off. It still doesn't go far enough. So how, you know, if you're going to affect change from within, how do you effectively challenge leadership and even not necessarily challenge, but how do you get them to take the progressive agenda seriously? Because one of my main criticisms lately ha has been of members of Congress who are progressive that don't actually challenge leadership in a really effective and meaningful way. And I think that if they held strong as a block and withheld votes once in a while, they would actually be more successful at, you know, just being taken seriously by, you know, members of Democratic Party leadership. So what's your stance on this whole battle with the HEROES Act? Would you have supported it? What do you think would have been the better strategy to get more progressive provisions included in the HEROES Act? Well, so, so to answer your question, I, I would have supported it and, and and mostly because in our district, there are so many people who have reached out to us because they're not getting what they need from their current congressperson who voted against it, by the way, and um, who are, are struggling and, and struggling pretty hardcore. And, and there are provisions here that will help. So, um, but, but as to your broader question, I mean, one of the things we need to do is to get different more progressive candidates into the Congress, right? Because as we expand that base, as we make sure that there's more of a block of, of progressive leaders in Congress, people who are willing to work across the aisle, people who are willing to challenge leadership, people who are willing to get things done, um, this is where we, we, we just need more people who are running on these platforms to get into Congress. And then I think that's where the negotiation starts too, right? Like we, this is this is a relatively new movement that we're seeing in Congress. 2018 was had some bright, shiny spots. We need a lot more of that to get things done. At what point do progressives in Congress actually really make a difference on the larger Democratic Party agenda? Because currently, you know, Nancy Pelosi won't allow a vote on Medicare for all, even though, you know, we know that it wouldn't pass the Senate. But symbolically, it would, it would make a difference and show voters that, you know, the Democrats just delivered on Medicare for all. They voted for it. So elect a Democrat or more Democrats and uh, you get Medicare for all delivered to you. Like, what do you think progressives can do? Because currently, I don't really see the strategy um, from members of the Congressional Progressive Congress uh, Caucus being utilized correctly? Like, I, I look to the Freedom Caucus. I disagree with them on everything, but you can't deny that they were effective and they really hammered leadership. So in, in terms of like going into Congress, this is difficult because you're not, you're not there yet. And, you know, you, you don't, you know, it, it'll be awkward, right? Because you don't necessarily want to challenge your own colleagues, your boss and Nancy Pelosi. That's so tough. So I, I can only imagine what that's like. But what will your strategy be to really elevate the progressive agenda, given the fact that in terms of numbers, you know, you don't have that much progressives, given the fact that, you know, you are taking on, you know, special interests. What will you do to basically make sure that what we want as, you know, the left, center left actually is going to get more of um more of a standing in Congress, if not passed altogether. Sure. Well, well, first of all, my boss will always be the constituents in my district. That's a good answer. And and so I I truly believe that people here deserve a voice, and and so I'm going to listen to them. Now we're a swing district, and I think when you have candidates that say like I'm going to listen to everybody and do what everybody wants, that's crazy, right? Yeah. Because like, um, like you know not half the district, but, you know, quarter of the district certainly are, don't agree with most of the things that I, that I would like to get done, although they would benefit tremendously from them. So I think the other place where we, we need to do this well is, is to really pick and choose our battles. And, and the, the, the tough thing right now is that with the pandemic, there's, there's, I mean, this is the worst crisis we've seen in the country other than Donald Trump as president <laughs> in a while, uh, if ever. And so, um, that this is a tough time to be, you know, I, I, I feel for Congresswoman Jayapal, I feel for, you know, some of the, or Congressman Rokana, like, I think that they've been incredible 
um, attempts to get some more progressive policies implemented. And, and I think we also have to look at wins from a different perspective, right? So, so what, what are the things that we can accomplish? Where are the things where we can get bipartisan support for them? I mean, when we talk about things, you know, people always ask me like, well, what are the things you can work with Republicans on? Well, infrastructure is certainly something that we all agree on. Um, you know, there, we, we all think that pharmaceutical prices are too high. And that was something Donald Trump ran on and we haven't seen any movement. And I guess when I say we all think that I have to go back and say, well, but Congressman Bacon voted against lowering prescription drugs. So most people think that they're too high. So I do think that there's some common ground there, but, um, but I think it's also, it, it's also going to take different voices, different kinds of messaging. And my background has been in bringing people together to solve problems. When I was hired to start my nonprofit in Omaha, Omaha Healthy Kids Alliance, my board was made up of membership who were you know, appointed by the Nebraska delegation, who were almost all Republicans. And we were able to get a lot of things done. I actually worked with uh, one of our Republican US senators years ago to help sponsor the Healthy Housing Council Act. He was the only Republican in the Senate that would even touch it. And it's to create a council to advise over healthy housing issues. It's not like some sort of radical thing, but like, but that's the work that I've done. So I believe I will take, I can take that experience and expertise to Congress to try to get some stuff done. That's great. That's encouraging to hear. Um, one last thing I want to ask you with regard to policy is in a perfect world, um, if you could pass whatever you wanted to with regard to COVID relief, what policies uh, would you implement? What do you think your constituents would need the most at this time immediately? Um, well, I, you know, and I, I think that the way that the it began and that and is ending is like it needs to be flipped, right? So it's always got to be working people first, workers first. Um, what are we doing for them? Bailing out the big corporations? Yeah, we can get to that, but like they're doing fine, right? Um, so, so starting there, starting with small businesses. I've talked to so many small business owners who are just don't know what they're going to do next. And when you have the president of the United States say things like small businesses will be fine, but maybe under new ownership. It's like, come on, dude, you don't yeah. like, you must understand on, on some level that these are family owned businesses that have been passed down for generations sometimes. And the idea that you would just completely disrespect that is so un-American to me. So it's like, we really have to start looking at this from a different perspective. So for me, that's where we would have started. Yeah, yeah. The response has been completely tone deaf. You know, there was a there was a moment in time where at the beginning of this pandemic, it kind of seemed like maybe we would see some bipartisanship in, in terms of relief. But, you know, that hope dissipated almost immediately when we, we just didn't get that. You know, a one time payment of twelve hundred dollars is obviously not enough for working families. And, you know, when they, you know, give us those crumbs, give working people those crumbs, but it's tied to a huge multi-trillion dollar bailout for special interests, you know, it, it just shows why we need people like you in Congress, because this can't keep continuing. We can't keep giving, you know, um, special interests, all of these gifts, for lack of a better word, while the working people continue to struggle. And, you know, the, the sense that I get from, you know, members of Congress and President Trump is that they don't even really seem to care anymore. Like the the belief is that, you know, workers got that $1,200 bailout, that's fine. You know, I think it was Steve Mnuchin who implied that it could last uh, 10 weeks or something to that effect, I'm paraphrasing. So it's just, it's ridiculous. So look, I, I think that anybody who's watching this is incredibly excited about your campaign and we wanna see you win. So give us your um, information about what we can do. If we don't leave, live in your district, how can we affect change and get you elected? What can we do for you? Because we all wanna see you in Congress. We know you'd be a fighter. How do we make that happen? Um, so if everybody watching could move to the district, <laughs> I think that would be really helpful. And then, um, <laughs> uh, you know, I, we we rely heavily on volunteers, as I said before. So we, we do have opportunities for people to sign up on our website, eastmanforcongress.com. I don't take corporate PAC money, so we also rely on grassroots donations and um, any amount is great. We have a, a program called Invest Her. That's a peer-to-peer -peer fundraising program. So you can sign up and you know set a goal for yourself. I want to get 20 people to donate, or I'm going to raise 50 bucks, or whatever it is. Um, we want to grow our grassroots support as much as possible. And then just spreading the word, commenting on our stuff on social media, letting people know that you know on our team that that, that you're with us. It's nice to feel this collective energy right now of people who actually want to change the country and move it in the right direction. 
Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much. And I will make my pitch for Kara. Um, even if you don't necessarily live in that district, the policies that she passes will be implemented nationally. Like I always like to point the, to the example of Ilhan Omar to where she proposed student debt cancellation. That impacts me directly and she's not my representative. So, you know, th this is about building, you know, a nationwide movement. And we do this in every single district and get, you know, as many progressives elected as we possibly can. So, Kara, thank you so much for uh, winning, first of all, and giving us kind of something to fight for and letting us know that a victory is possible even in very weird circumstances with you know a, a pandemic and whatnot and yeah we'll be we'll be rooting for you and watching this race closely if i don't have you back on before the election hopefully i can bring you on when you're actually a member of congress that will be uh very exciting that would be great i'm happy to come on anytime thank you thank you so much cara cara eastman running in nebraska's second congressional district against republican don bacon uh, links will be in the description box if you would like to donate and support her campaign. Well, that is all that I have for you all uh, today. Thank you all so much for tuning in. If you've made it this far in the episode, uh, as usual, we're not going to end the show without thanking all of our Patreon, PayPal, and YouTube members for helping the show not just to survive, but thrive as well. You all are the lifeblood of this show, and we just absolutely cannot do this without you. So I truly appreciate you. And if you cannot contribute monetarily, uh, trust me, just liking the videos, watching the videos, that really does go a long way. So don't feel as if you're not also helping us, because if you're just watching and liking and commenting, that really does help the program uh so uh i'm done talking i've got nothing left to say thank you all so much for tuning in uh i will see you next week uh this is uh the humanist report i'm mike figueredo i've run out of words so uh, i'm done talking